as we've been reading the book of Isaiah according to the Bible time, and last Sunday we talked about chapter 42, how God introduced his servant, and this man is his very own son, Jesus Christ. But because the Israelites at the time were not able to embrace this knowledge, he introduced his son as, Behold my servant. So we saw last Sunday, there's a servant, Jesus Christ, who is the servant of humility. Because even though he's preaching the truth and the gospel and teaching the people in the streets, he will not raise his voice because he was not about doing his own business. It was not about exalting his own name, be known by the people, but he was mindful of exalting name of God and also doing the business of his father. So he was the servant of humility. And then we also saw that he was servant of tenderness, that he will not break the bruised reed. He will not quench smoking flax. He will even try to rekindle the flame that is about to die. He was a servant of tenderness. And then at the same time, he was the servant of steady fastness. No matter what, however people opposed him, he will never be discouraged or fail until he established the judgment on the ends of the earth. And also, he will open the eyes of the blind and he will rescue, deliver those people who are captivity in the dark prison. So, mostly, in chapter 42, he's, we saw how he is, what kind of person this servant of the Lord is. Now today, as we continue on, we are going to land on chapter 52 from verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. This is a passage about suffering Christ. But unfortunately, until today, the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, still will reject their own Messiah, Jesus Christ. So every week in synagogue, as they worship their God, God of Israel, on Sabbath, they do have a yearly Bible reading schedule, just like we have a Bible time. And on Sabbath, they do read as they get together the Old Testament. The Old Testament, God's Word, is a Torah or Tanakh. And they have a yearly schedule. It's always the same, worldly, everywhere, every time. On 48th week, if you look at this screen, they call reading portion of Torah as Paras. And Shoftim is a 48th week, weekly reading. So that weekly reading on that particular week in synagogue, when Jewish people get together, they will read Deuteronomy chapter 16 from verse 18 through 21, verse 9. Not only they read the Torah, which is five books of Moses, but they will also read a portion of prophets. And on that particular 48th week, Haptara, which is a portion reading of Prophets, on that particular week, they read Isaiah 51, verse 12, through 52, verse 12. But strangely, following week, which is a week 49th, and they call it Parash Kiptes. The portion of Torah is the same. They continue on from Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verse 10. So they pick up from verse 9, from previous week, they read up to chapter 25, verse 10. However, when they read the book of Isaiah, Toptara, they read 54, verse 1 and 10. So they skip chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. As we know, this passage is a rather famous passage. 
it talks about prophecies on coming Messiah who will be suffering on the cross for you and I. This is the literal prophecy of coming Messiah. This passage is a D gospel message of Old Testament. But unfortunately, the Jewish people will skip this portion and has been skipping this until today. Why do you think the reason is? Because the Jewish people, they oppose Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. And also, we need to understand the sentiment. Historically, last 2,000 years, Christians under the banner of cross, under the banner of name of Jesus Christ, that we, by ignorance, been persecuting Jewish people, thinking they are the one who crucified and killed our Messiah. So, during the crusade and Spanish Inquisition in various ways, Christians horrendously persecuted and killed the Jewish people. So not only theologically, by Judaism, they rejected Jesus Christ, but also emotionally, they refused the Christians and reject their own Messiah, the suffering Christ. But rabbis, whenever they read the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, it's so obvious, it's so apparent, this passage is talking about Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago, who has uh, suffered, who was uh, persecuted and mocked and died on the cross. But still, they are not able to accept this uh, suffering Christ. So parents will not allow their Jewish young boys and girls to read Isaiah 53 and rabbis until today will continually skip over this uh, passage. But we as children of God, we as Christians, we have a tremendous privilege to read this passage because this passage is about our lover, our savior, our Lord, our master, our everything. Our core reason for existence lies on this passage because this passage talks about our Lord, our breath, our everything. Brothers and sisters, often when I stand behind this podium to talk about God's truth and deliver his message, I feel unworthy, unfeeding to deliver his voice and his truth. But today is probably one of the most difficult days And I want to talk about this passage, but I'm so filthy, I'm so unworthy to bring about this passage. My love, my Savior, my Lord, my everything, my core reason to breathe and exist. And with a trembling heart, with a fearful heart, that I want to talk about Jesus Christ from the very passage, the chosen people, Jewish people, reject and omit. But I sincerely ask God and ask the Holy Spirit and ask Jesus himself to hide me behind the cross. That he himself may be able to reveal himself and speak for himself and present himself to you and I. In chapter 42 of the book of Isaiah, God himself said, Behold my servant, and revealed who this servant was. But today, our God will same way, will introduce his servant, his very own beloved son. Behold my servant, but today, further, he's going to describe about his servant, but particularly what he has gone through 
what he lived here on earth, and what he has done for you and I. So let's turn our Bible to book of Isaiah chapter 52. And from verse 13, we are going to read chapter 53 up to verse 12. So let us read it together. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth at him, for what had not been told them, they shall she. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when ye, we see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, submitted by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like a sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12 altogether. Therefore, for I will, I will divide, divide him a portion with, with the great, and, and he, he shall divide, divide the spoil with the strong. strong. Because, because he, he poured, poured out his, his soul unto, unto death, death. And, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made the intercession for the transgressors. Amen. God starts out with, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He says, Behold. Something that we want to understand, heart of our God, when he continually introduces his servant, Jesus Christ, his beloved son. Behold my servant. Behold my servant shall deal prudently. And IV says, behold my servant will act wisely. And when God says behold, can we imagine? He has been waiting for thousands of years as he's introducing his beloved son to you and I. From the generation, from the beginning, he already knew as a human, humankind, we will utterly fail before him. He will, we will rebel against him. We will be separated from him and we will be rejected from him, his presence. But he loved us so much. But his holiness will continually prevent us of us coming back to him. So there must be some plan. There must be some solution for us to return back to him. But as a trying God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they were enjoying perfect unity and unison and intimacy and fellowship. And God loves his son with a 
eternal perfect love. And this son loves him so much. But they are agonizing. They are in full grief together as they look over fallen sinful humanity who dearly are loved by them. So the father says to the son, my son, would you be able to go down to the earth and make the way for them to return back to us? Because they are lost, because they are smitten, because they are utterly confused, and they live like animals, but they are created according to our image, and we created them to enjoy utter fellowship of love so that may, they may reveal our glory. But would you go down and lay down your own life and be marred and without calm, calmness, without form, without beauty, would you willing to be rejected and despised and persecuted and hated and and be grieved and suffer and utterly die on the cross and bear their iniquities. And Jesus, the servant of God, the son of God, in obedience, but his motivation is not just dutiful obedience, but because his love for the Father is so great, that he is willing to empty himself, willing to pour down his life unto filthy earth as wine poured and wasted. And this has been planned generations before. And the father, when the due time came, <laughs> finally he's able to say, Behold, behold my servant. Behold my servant. Would he be able to understand the heartbeat of our father? His feeling, his emotion. Yes, he has a perfect knowledge. But with this amazing plan that he introduces, he's a servant. Our savior, our hope, our life, our everything. But inside the core heart of our father, He's a son, he's a servant. Never at a point of eternity he had a forgotten, he didn't remember, but it was always in the core heart of the father how he loved his son, but will send him to the world as a, he's a servant, as a suffering Christ. But on the other hand, how about us, you and I? When do we behold this servant? Are we like the Father 24 7? They're always loving this servant, embracing him, and wanting to desire to have an intimacy with him. Or when do we behold this servant, our Savior, our Master, our King, Jesus Christ? Sometimes when the life only gets difficult, when we go through the trials and suffering, when we are in pain, we cry out, why, Jesus, why? Is it only time that I behold this servant? Or sometimes some of us, only when we fail miserably in our own iniquities, in our own sins, and how we are so embarrassed and we are so shamed, and in this humiliation, then only we look up our head and behold this Jesus. Or is it that our longing, our craving, our sincere desire every day, every moment, is it to behold the servant of God, like our Father? And this is how our God introduces his servant, his son. And he says, my servant shall deal prudently. 
What do you mean? NIV says, my servant will act wisely. What kind of wisdom is this? As we read this passage, he's mocked, he's marred, he's undesirable. He's rejected, despised it. He became friend to sorrows. He's grieving. What do you mean? What kind of life is this wise? You say, my servant will act wisely or prudently. You see, the wisdom of this world teaches us how to live. You need to climb up the ladder. You need to be honest to your feeling. Whatever you want, go, grab it, get it. Trample down other people. Achieve. Follow your ambition. Use other people for your own benefit, for your own desire, for your own needs. What is uh, my need? What can this company do for me? What can my wife do for me? My husband do for me? What will my children will do for my desire, my own need? What can my church can do for me? That's the wisdom of this world. But God's a servant, the way he lived, the way he suffered, you call that that he acted wisely? We've been reading book of Proverbs every day. And we know the wisdom starts by fearing God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We know that. But the way this servant lived, you call that wise life. But God says that is is a wisdom. When Christians, when the followers of Jesus Christ mimic life pattern of their master, they're willing to give up their own dream for their followers. They're willing to give their time and resources, and they're willing to be unknown and be rejected. If that means others may live, that I may be sown into the ground and die so that others may live and survive. The parents giving up their dream, the parents are toiling for the sake of their own children, pastors for the sake of their flock, and other people willing to give up their time, missionaries going to Egypt, Turkey, Israel, and other nations, giving their youthfulness and surrendering. To the eyes of the world, that's a foolishness. What do you mean? What do you mean? You will live for the sake of other people, not for your own. The very servant that we call our master, he did come to the world, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. For you and I. And God called it wise life. And God said, he acted it prudently. And then God exalted him. God extolled him and made him very high. Before he introduces this servant of his suffering, immediately he reveals the last chapter of his story, that he will be exalted, extorted, be very high. This is the same thing, that I will elevate him so high and put him on the highest throne. He uses three different vocabularies just to say the same thing. He acted wisely so that I elevate him to high. You know, whenever God and Jesus says, Amen, Amen, or surely, or surely I say to you, if he says the same thing twice differently, it's a very emphatic. But if God says a three times the same thing over, that means it's really, really emphatic. So, brothers and sisters, in this life, when my life is wasted, when my life my dream is given up for the sake of others. 
when my money, my time are spent for the sake of his church and for the sake of his gospel. In the eyes of the world, this is a foolishness. But in the eyes of our God, this is wisdom. Whether in this world or world to come, God will exalt us. Whomever obeys himself shall be exalted. And that's life your master and my master has just shown. And he begins to introduce how he lived in verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you. So his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. At the cross, during the crucifixion, Roman soldiers slapping upon his face with a rod, beating him, 40 lashes, and the crown of thorns crushed upon his forehead. His face being marred, his body bruised, and many people were not even able to look at the cross because his visage was so utterly marred. Then on verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth at him. For what had it not been told, them they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Immediately, God talks about, yes, when my servant came to you first, he was utterly marred. You were not even able to see him properly. But when he comes back for the second time, when the millennial kingdom, my messianic kingdom will be established here on earth, he will splinter. He will just scatter all nations, those rulers and kings and queens who used to abuse my people and dictate my people and abuse power and authorities. And they will be astonished by this true eternal king coming down to earth. And he will be ruling my people on the mountain Zion in the city called Jerusalem. And the kings and queens, they never heard and they were closed and shut their mouth at the glory of the servant of God. And moving on to chapter 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our report? This amazing message of the salvation of humankind. This is available for every soul, all the nations. However, only some remnant will accept this report. And although his righteous arm will gather the lost cheeks, but the only obedient, only elected ones, his arm will be revealed, and that's you and I. That's utter grace, because we deserved damnation. And there's no base of our election except by his sovereign grace. Then on verse 2, he says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Indeed, the tender plant, he was a servant of tenderness. Although he was the creator himself, when he came to you and I, he was born in a manger. He had no room for him to dwell in. He was under submission for the parents who were unknown in the city called the Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he was a carpenter's son. And he was as a root out of dry ground. Yes, Israel was like a dry ground, devastated, filthy by the sins and iniquities of the people this world was a dry ground. 
bearing wickedness, evil. There was no good fruit. But that his servant will root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. With his outward appearance, there was nothing that was attracted from him. No one desired him. There was no beauty. Isn't he ironic? He is the creator, the creator of the beauty. When we see the ocean mountains and stars at night, when we look at a flower, the beauty of God is so amazing. But yet, he purposefully came to the world without form, without beauty. No one desired him. Some weeks ago, one of the cell leaders, a sister, Kakao me with a couple of Sam members asking somewhat theological question to me. Pastor Shine, the Bible says Jesus was tried in every way, but he was never given in to sin. Do you think Jesus was tempted with a lust? When he saw a sexy woman or attractive woman, do you think his heart was moved? By the lust. And I told him no. He probably was able to recognize which one is a prettier one, which one is not so. But never in his heart the lust after the beauty of other women. Then another question from them was, then do you think during his public ministry there will be some women who are attracted to him as a man, as a woman as attracted to handsome guy, or so forth. And to answer that question, I didn't have a theologically correct answer because it doesn't talk about it in the Bible. It is a possible, but I told them, most likely not. Why? According to the scripture, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was an undesired servant. In other words, he was a totally ugly dude. When men and women see him, there's nothing attractive outwardly. But why did he come, the creator of beauty? Why did he come in such ugliness? Without form, without beauty. It is because of you and I. Because we as a men and women, we are so preoccupied and obsessed by how we look outwardly. But we must understand, continually remind ourselves, it's not our appearance God looks at. He looks at our heart. As God spoke to prophet Samuel in the first Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. This. But the Lord said to Samuel to not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Because Samuel was about to anoint the first son who was a good looking, who had a high stature. For the Lord does not see as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Whether you and I recognize it or not, our self-identity, self-esteem fluctuates depending upon how we look, how others standard judge us who we are by our our appearance. That's an utter lie and wisdom of the world, not the wisdom of God. So to defy that, Jesus purposefully came to the world as a such an ugly man. So that outwardly, there's no, absolute zero attraction. However, he was a such an attractive man, the greatest man ever lived on the face of earth. By his own deeds, by his own character, by his own heart posture, who was deeply in love with his father, fully and every second connected with his father. 
that makes anyone utterly attractive. We are living in a generation, in a nation, who spends $16.5 billion on plastic surgery. America is the number one country who has the most number of plastic surgeries in a year. Then, Korea is number one country who does a plastic surgery the most by population ratio. Now, Korea spends over $1.2 billion each year for the cosmetic for men. We are utterly deceived and obsessed by our appearance. But Jesus defies that and teaches us life is not about how you look. Life is not how about you outwardly achieve and perform. It is about your heart posture. It is about your character. It is about your deed. It is about your life sacrificing for the sake of others. We all know Nick Vujicic. If we can look at his photo, life without limb. As he was born, his parents suffered, he himself suffered, agonized how he was like this. But God transformed his life, redeemed him, changed him. Some of us, if we are to personally meet him, we may feel a little bit uncomfortable to meet him eye to eye because of the way he looks. But he became the hope for the hopeless so many teenagers who are suicidal, when they listen to his testimonies, they will cry, weep, and begin to bring hope. Isn't Jesus, his message, his deed like that? And God redeemed his life in a way, if we look at a second picture of his life. He's married to a beautiful wife. They have four children. It doesn't matter how we look. It doesn't matter about our appearance. God defies today's culture, defies worldly wisdom, and uses despised, undesired for his glory because for him, everyone is lovable. About 16 or 17 years ago, in Korea, there was a college girl, rather pretty one. If you look at her picture, she was a Christian singing in a church, praising God. After she was done with the class at a college, with her brother, they were driving, coming back home, and they were at the stoplight. And there was a drunken driver behind them, and hit the car, and the car was so small, and it flipped and fumbled around. In five minutes, the car was on fire. And by the time her brother woke up, her upper body was in flame. And he tried to put away the fire with his sweater putting her on face, but it was too late. She was utterly marred. Her face was totally burnt. We cannot imagine what kind of agony, suffering, and pain and devastation that she must have gone through. She had about 40 different surgeries and continually because of her skin that she has to be treated. Every time she walks in the street, people may feel uncomfortable looking at her face. Gasping, maybe with a softer voice, look at her, how she looks, her arm, her face. As you can see in the picture, after the accident, that's how she looked. After some time of toil, she wrote her testimony. The book was called 
I love you, Chi Sun. Her name was Chi Sun Lee. God calling her, Chi Sun, I love you. Even after that accident, God began to redeem her life and transform her life. 17 years after, during the time she came to America to further study, went to Boston College for her graduate study, went to UCLA for her PhD, got the degree on social welfare. Now she's serving as a professor at Handong International University, the first Christian university. It's international and global. God redeemed her life. And she shares a testimony. There has been numerous times when I walk down the street, young, pretty-looking women will walk up to her and grab her arm. I know who you are. I'm Chu Chi's son. I read your book because I was so suicidal. But after reading your testimony, I'm alive today, and I'm able to meet you. Seemingly, looking so pretty, seemingly, she seems to possess everything. But for some reason, she's a suicidal. But when she looks at this woman whose face is utterly burnt and marred, will have a hope to live. Is an our Jesus, who was so marred and who was utterly undesired. And because of him, we have a hope. And we have a desire to live and wake up another day. One day, as she was being interviewed by the reporters, one of the reporters asked her, she said, don't you wish to go back the days before the car accident? Then she replied, no, I don't. I don't want to go back to the days before the car accident because I met the Lord Jesus in a way I will never be able to before the accident. The Jesus I met and I walk with is no comparison with the days before the car accident. Verse 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with the grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne out of griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. This is a servant of the God was despised and rejected by men. He is the creator himself, but when he came down to earth to love him, to redeem them, to become their atonement for this fallen humankind. In the book of John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says, he, book of John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. He himself was the creator of the world. The world that did not know him. He come, he came to his own, his own people, but his own did not receive him. The darkness hated the light, and they rejected it and despised him. Even during the time of crucifixion, Pilate trying to rescue him, and deliver him. And brought Jesus to the crowd and multitude. Whom do you want me to release? All of us or Jesus, the king of the Jew? 
And the crowd jeered and cried out, yelled and screamed, We want Barabbas. Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Release Barabbas. What do you want me to do with the king of Jews? Your Messiah, your Savior, your Lord, your Master. What do you want me to do with Jesus of Nazareth? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. He is your king. The king of Jews. No. We have a Caesar as our king. None else. Caesar is our king. His very own chosen people. His very own creation. You and I at the cross demanded a Barabbas. The one who was a thief and instructor. And we said... We have no king, a Caesar. Don't we do that continually? Even after we accepted Jesus as our Savior. When I chased after lust of the world and ambition of the world. When I decide to reject his truth and go after doctrines and philosophies of this world. Am I not saying still, I have no king. But except Jesus Caesar, my king is a Caesar, not Jesus Christ. And he is dwelling inside of us. But continually we despise him, continually we reject him. But yet, he will never leave us and forsake us. He will never disown us. He will continually come to us and try to embrace us and say, I love you. I love you. That love I don't completely fathom but we understand his pain to a certain degree because we as imperfect men and women we end up being despised rejected we also reject others and despise others. Rejection is at the greatest difficulties and pain in our life because we still carry the wound in our sinful nature. When we rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden, God rejected us. His holiness will not allow us to dwell in that garden. And the scar is a permanent in our heart. So anytime anyone despise me, anytime who reject me, it's unbearable pain. And we agonize over it. We are in deep sorrow. And our identity, esteem, utterly being broken. We don't know what to do. The pain is so great. So that's why we want to gain approval and praises from men by performance. That we want to perform continually, our soul becomes restless because I need, by performance, I need to gain the approval, the rejection, the pain is so severe. So we try hard to please man. But one thing we, as a followers of Jesus Christ, our Jesus, although he was despised and rejected, by his own, that's you and I, continually, even today, the Jewish people rejecting him utterly, omitting Isaiah 53, the very description of the Messiah of Israel. But his love never alters. He never gives up of loving you and I and embracing us. But to follow him, we need to learn to deal with the rejection. Because it will be so naive to think, because I'm reconciled back to God and he loves me, that people will love me. No, absolutely not. The more we approach the last days, the Bible is clear. It says they will despise you because they despise me first. As followers of Jesus Christ, we must train ourselves how to handle rejection, although it's so painful. 
Sometimes God will purposefully allow despise and rejection in our life to crush our ego, to be more like a Jesus as a followers of this servant of God. And especially if you want to serve God and his people, get ready to be despised and rejected. In a way, I'm so thankful because under the leadership of Pastor Kim and Missionary Kang, I learned to be approved by God alone. I'm not perfect. I fail in this area as well. But they trained me well. Not to be recognized by the people. Not to be praised by the man. Not to be acknowledged by the people but rather by God and Him alone. Otherwise, I cannot be your lead pastor. Just because I'm the lead pastor, not all people welcome me. Not all people will accept me. There's always rejections here and there. But if we as followers of Jesus Christ only love those who welcome us, accept us, and prove us, what has it got to do with the gospel? When Jesus told us, love your enemies. When they despise you, pray for them. When they persecute you. When they hit you on the right cheek, give your left cheek. Just because they welcome us. And they are the only people we love them. How can we send the missionaries to the Muslims? How can we send the missionaries to the nation of Israel? The Jews and Muslims alike despise the Christians. Despise Americans, although they reject us, and we continually, by the strength of Christ, go to them, try to embrace them, wait for them, and love on them. Some years ago, when I was in KM, Pastor Han called me and asked me to oversee a particular group because this group was torn apart leader of that group decided to plant a church. So over 100 people of congregants who were divided, should I follow him or not? And there were some talks among the leadership, and some decided and talked to one another, hey, let's uh, follow this leader and leave this uh, church. Some were left out. Some were not in that conversation. So they felt abandoned, rejected. So wound was a gray. And the spiritual atmosphere was a very lost hurt. And Pastor Hang asked me to go on a particular Sunday, introduce myself as a new leader. Oh, man, did I feel a rejection. These people, none of them said hi to me. And as with a big smile, we'll go to them and say, hi, how are you? What's your name? People will just walk by through me. You know, Koreans, because they're in shame culture, even though they don't feel like it, at least by their face, by respect of a pastor, they will say yes. But these people utterly broken and reject me. Why are you here? Oh, man, if I was not trained with a rejection previously, it would be so difficult. Yeah, it was difficult. But weeks later, they begin to open up. And God began to heal their wounds. Brothers and sisters, there's a servant of God who is our Messiah, who is our lover, who is our Savior, who is our Master. He had no form, no beauty purposefully, to show us a life that is more meaningful. It's not about outward appearance. It was not about outside performance or achievement. It's about heart posture. It's about our heart, our character, our deeds that are pleasing to the sender. And he was rejected. He is continually despised even in our own days. But yet, he never gives up loving 
you and I. He overrides rejection because he knows he is accepted by the one, his father. And that's the same way for you and I. Let us all rise. As much as God the Father was eager to introduce his servant, his son, more or less, he himself, the servant of the Lord, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, wants to come and touch us, speak to us, anoint us, Heal us, comfort us, encourage us, and wants to reveal himself to every one of us. His presence can never be contained. It is a matter of our heart, how we understand his love, how much we desire him. And as we sing, this last praise, let us sincerely welcome him. Let us truly ask God, God, increase my knowledge of your servant. God, increase my love for him. God, would you continually reveal your servant to me? Although his outward appearance was with no beauty but he is the most beautiful person I ever known and I will ever know I want to know him I want to love him 